The formal mission of U equals me is stated as a movement of conscientious objectors to intolerance, or simply stated, a movement against intolerance. And the exploration of that statement really gets to what what are the similarities between people? What do we all have in common? Why are we really equal as humankind? And that's what we're going to explore. This podcast is about exploring conversational thoughts and interviews with extraordinary people living ordinary lives of well-being. Discussions on exactly what well-being means to people day to day, factors that can influence it both internally and externally. We glean insights on how to survive and thrive in feeling satisfied in life with a greater sense of purpose. Guest hosts bring fresh new outlooks and opinions from spirituality, science, worldviews, and standing up and speaking out for what's right. It's pretty interesting. Man needs each other and planet Earth to survive. Check it out. I think you'll like what you hear. Me podcast. I want to thank all of our friends and family from around the world for listening today. Sylvia, Nikki, and family in England, Jacqueline in Ireland, Pietro and family in Italy, Diane in Portugal, Michele in France, Kate in Australia, and Clint in Vietnam, not to mention our friends and family here at home in the U.S. We love you and look forward to seeing you again. We are truly connected, although we're on different continents. COVID is uniting the world through our scientists working together on our global health. Isolation feels as if it's contributing to our separation, but we are not alone. Now's the time to take care of each other and our earth to survive pandemics, climatic disasters. We need each other. One day at a time, one conversation at a time, we will get through this. Our goal as a foundation is to inspire our day-to-day lives by bringing together people of all different walks of life, by sharing personal experiences, both internal and external, for a greater sense of purpose and belonging. Our guest is one of our favorite people. I'm so excited. She will also be guest hosting on this podcast with a lineup of fantastic, colorful interviews that I know you'll find interesting. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Lynn Brewer. Welcome, Lynn. Thanks, Cindy. It's great to be here. I'm so glad you agreed to this. I just love our conversations, and it seems like we can just go on forever and ever when we chat. It's just so fun for me. Very interesting. I want to give you a little background, uh, a little bit of Lynn's background. Lynn is a keynote speaker, a business ethics speaker, strategic advisor, and the author of the book, Confessions of an Enron Executive, a whistleblower story that has become globally known authority on what went wrong at Enron. Since 2002, she's delivered close to 200 speeches around the world, recounting the wrongs she witnessed at Enron, a company that grossly overstated its earnings and collapsed into bankruptcy. In recognition of her bravery in speaking out as a whistleblower, the Nobel Peace Center in Oslo featured Lynn in an exhibition devoted to the freedom of speech. Wow, you are very, you are one very brave person. Well, I don't know if bravery is the right, um, right word, but certainly when you see injustice, at least the fiber of my being is to stand up and speak up. Good for you. Were you ever afraid? I mean, were you worried that, uh, I don't know, that was a pretty big, um, that was a pretty big whistleblow. Well, um, so I was at one point afraid only when I um, had to hire a criminal lawyer um, in defense of anything that I may have seen or participated in, which I did not. I only witnessed numerous instances of the illegal behavior clean bank fraud and espionage, and finally decided that um, someone needed to know about it, that Enron's earnings um, were clearly overstated, but more importantly, there was this culture of corruption 
um, where you were rewarded for doing things that were not ethical. And so um, I hired a criminal lawyer and the lawyer said, um, do not use your computer, do not answer the phone, don't use your cell phone. And, you know, that's a little bit, I mean, it sounds dramatic. It, that's exactly what happened. And, and certainly that would make anyone sort of afraid at the time. But I quickly... Of course. Yeah, yeah the backlash. Yeah. The backlash from the, from the company. I mean, because they, they, were, they got pretty nasty. Yeah, I mean, it it was most interesting. About two weeks before his passing, Ken Lay invited me to come to Houston to meet with him. Ken Lay was the former chairman and CEO of the company. Okay. And I wasn't high enough up in the company. I was a mid-level executive in the legal department. And I met with Ken and laid out the evidence that I had and the memos that I had done while I was inside Enron. And he said to me, after he had been indicted, um, he said, you know, I just can't get my head around the fact that you likely knew more about this company than I did. And for me, that was the aha moment that so many times these CEOs put their, their clearly their freedom in the hands of people that work in the organization. But, really, yeah. but more importantly, um, it became apparent to me that CEOs are often insulated from what is really going on in the organization. I don't think CEOs yes. in general go to work and say, I'm going to be corrupt. Um, they right. like to lead an organization for the benefit of shareholders and customers and or clients. But in this case, you know, it, it was a sad day for me because he was going, he was going to go to prison had he not had a heart attack and died. Now, that's interesting because um, you would think that it would be systemic you know, corruption, you would think that it was coming from the top down. It was, but he didn't, he wasn't aware of it. Yeah. I mean, I think he was, it was plausible deniability, right? He, <laughs> right, you know, yeah. so I, I don't, I think it's your duty to know what's going on in an organization. And it was systemic throughout the organization. It just didn't get, you know, it's, I mean, it would be similar to saying, how much do you think that President Ob uh, President Biden hears today about what's going on within True. the entire federal government. Um, not True. likely. True. So um, this happened in 1998? or I some, went to work for Enron in 1998, and the bankruptcy happened in December of 2001. So you, wow, uh, you did some great things for a lot of people. Um, you know, and Enron they they were they were doing some very bad things but um you decided then how how did you get on the circuit how did you get on you wrote a book about it your book um uh confessions of an enron executive a whistleblower story how did that come about you just started were you just noting everything as you went along yes yeah, so um you know i have a law degree and so what you do as a lawyer is you preserve documents. And so I had preserved the documents um, that I had written and acquired while inside Enron, um, not intentionally, but they had transferred me from Houston to Portland. And so those documents came with me. And then when I left the company, um, you know, like everybody, you know, hauling out documents, you know, and records, I began to... Um, decide to write a, a actually quite frankly a fiction book about some of the using some of the characters inside Enron as the antagonist and protagonist of a story and as I was working on that more and more things came to light about Enron in general and what happened is in June of 2001 um there was a radio show host in Seattle by the name of Dory Monson doing a show about manipulation of power prices um, at Seattle City Light. And I sent an email and said, if you really want to know what's going on, um, I'll tell you. Uh -huh. And so he put me on the radio and, you know, off it went. But prior to to it was in it was in September of 2001, I went to a leadership conference trying to figure out what I was going to do next. And in that leadership conference, I revealed the fact that I was working at Enron and um, 
trying to, um, or that I had worked at Enron at that point, and that I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next. And in that leadership conference, a lot of things came out. And the, the, the person that was holding the conference had had a speaking engagement and was unable to do it and asked if I would go and do the engagement for him. I did. And that just launched a speaking career that I never intended to have. Right, right. It was meant to be. Uh, you were supposed to um, expose yourself and your talents. You know, I think it's just why, why, Lynn, is it important for people to stand up and speak out, even if it means losing their jobs or having their reputation smeared? Why, why was it important for you? Um, for me, it was about the fiber of who I am. I used to use the term integrity because I met, I really focused on structural integrity of organizations, um, which means that they can't be corrupted and they withstand market forces and all of those things, much like a building um, in a gale force wind. But I now look more at this concept of honor and what does it mean to be honorable and honor that which is within you and honor that which is within others, which is, of course, why I am so thrilled about you equals me, because that honor is a consistent voice between two of us or between us and a community or a society. And I think that that's the thing that is our guiding light in life is our honor to ourselves and to be honest with ourselves that if we follow that, we can only do one thing, and that is to stand up. Yeah. Yeah. Good. No, it's it's wonderful that, that you did that. And I think what's important for people to know is that you, this didn't, this didn't um, hurt your career at all. It actually, it actually brought um, more attention to honor and integrity. So it, it, it was a, it's a fabulous, uh, movement that you have like, hey, people, you know, this is wrong. And it didn't hurt your career at all. I mean, well, I, I think, it, you know, I would say it, it, it certainly has hurt if I desired to go back into corporate America, because corporate America does not hire whistleblowers for the most part. But what I think it did, more importantly, is it launched a movement that said standing up for what's right it's, and being honorable. It's okay and, and to so speak it, it just up. took a different route. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's okay to mm -hmm. speak up. Um, do you have any Correct. advice for uh, some people who may be thinking about speaking out and might be fearful of doing so, you know, that might be afraid of losing their jobs or, 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 you know, even more importantly, Lynn, afraid of having to move uh, careers, you know, like you did. Yeah, so I actually um, have always been a really, really hard worker. So, uh, you know, someone that, you know, I often say that um, I'm proud of the fact that I'm a workaholic. But I do think that, you know, 50% of people who blow the whistle, you know, end up divorced. And, you know, my husband and I have been together um, more than half my life now, and he stood by me throughout this thing. And so I do think that it's a, whenever you are leaving whatever you're doing and you're standing up and taking a position, um, it's scary. It's a scary it proposition because you don't, you don't know what's on the other side. Exactly. So, but I think that in our quiet moments and, and times where we remove all the noise, yeah. there's something inside of us that drives us to do something. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that, um, I think I've told you that, you know, um, since the Great Recession of 2007, 2008, last year, the SEC received more whistleblowing reports than any other time right. since the Great Recession. And so I think people are standing up and people are speaking out and they're saying, what is going on? Um, is simply a repeat. I call it Enron 3.0. Uh -huh. And I think people, it's evidence that people are standing up. I think if you look at, um, while I don't agree with certainly the method of the riots, the, 
the voice of people wanting to be heard is welling up. And I think we are having an, perhaps a revolution, but at the very least an evolution exactly. of our voice. Exactly. With the Black Lives Matter and even what's going on in Russia right in this moment, you know, the protesting, right. it's, uh, I think it definitely makes a difference. We have to stand up. Otherwise, we're, we're just going to be mowed over with, you know, corruption. Right. And I do think that we have to get to a place where we're also willing to stand up for others. And that's what the Black Lives Ma uh, Matter yeah. movement has done. It started with a, a football player who took a knee and said, look, exactly. this racial injustice within the law enforcement, you know, we've got to change that. And he took his single voice, didn't say a thing, did a silent knee. And, you know, it, it literally was sort of the knee that changed the world, yeah, it's true. you know, and that's, that's who you are. It's, I, we have a fabulous quote in our ebook, Wisdom Along the Way, a strong quote, a strong person stands up for himself and a stronger person stands up for everyone, unquote. And that is definitely how you live your life. And you're a, you're a wonderful example for all of us and hard worker. Well, I certainly, as we've discussed at times, I call myself Miss Mean Tweets because <laughs> um, it is that voice inside that is frustrated by incompetence uh -huh. and it's frustrated by a lack of integrity. It's There are so many things that in society that go on that, you know, people really suffer from right. because people don't stand up on their behalf. Right. And so... And, yeah. and some people um, may just be ignorant to some of the issues as well and may not really understand what's going on. So, uh, you know, everybody needs a champion and you're definitely, uh, you know, a champion for the people. Thank you for that. Well, I think it's an interesting thing because I think if we look at the premise of you equals me, that within each of us, is a voice that desires to be heard. And our job is to keep an open mind. And in doing so, we will, if we keep an open mind, we'll hear something different than we've ever mm -hmm. heard before. Mm -hmm. um, I, I use this example oftentimes. Timothy McVeigh, who bombed the Oklahoma City building, of course, that is not the way to have your voice heard. Right. But if you look back to his, um, I, the letters he wrote before he did that, you begin to see that he he had this voice that said, this is not right. And I think I think it's because people are not heard and people don't listen mm -hmm. and welcome differing opinions right. that cause this this anger to erupt. Oh, yes. I, yeah, I totally agree. I, I, when you're when you feel like you're out in the margins, that's a very lonely place to be. It really is. It really is. And what's happened now is there's a collective consciousness of anger that that is fueled by conspiracy theories and all, all sorts of other, you know, I call them crazy ideas, but, um, you know, there's, there's no reality in them. And, and unfortunately, as you listen to people whose family members have gotten caught up in this, yeah. um, you know, they, they just like felt like they were losing their loved ones to um, yeah. something that didn't have any sense of reality to yeah. it. And it's clearly because they felt like they hadn't been heard. Mm -hmm. There's undoubtedly. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I think that it's difficult for us to understand, you know, how, how that happened. But when we, you have leaders of countries that are not transparent, you, you'll have people following. So right, maybe help people along, help people with jobs and insurance and health care. All of those things matter. Right. And I do think that our greatest enemy is our judgment, yes. right? Because we judge, we judge others for the position they take. And then, and then the next step we take is to shame them. Yes. Um, and then the next step is we outcast, you know, we, cause them to be an outcast either in our lives or in society and you know here we are yeah. you know we've got an uprising of what 74 million people who voted for a, a president who 
has very strange ideas. And, you know, I think that are driven by his desire for power. Mm -hmm. um, And, and they glom onto that. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a crazy time. And, and I, I do agree with you. I think this is all, this is all coming up, uh, bubbling up to the surface so that we can look at, um, look at ourselves a little, go inside and look at our judgments that we have against uh, other people. And everybody, everybody judges. It's almost impossible not to. But I think to have a more peaceful life just as a person, it's important to, to look at these things. It's important to to look at the way we're shaming people and ourselves, you know, what we do to ourselves, right. that, that nasty little voice inside of our own heads that say, you're not, you're not worthy. And that's just not true. We're, we're all worthy of a, of a wonderful life. And yeah. I do think that technology and social media, like I don't have a Facebook account. My vice is Twitter, uh-huh. as you know, but Um, you know, if we look at the role that social media has played in driving attitudes, right, by pushing content that, you know, I mean, and it's well known that Facebook did a um, social study on whether or not it could actually brainwash people, um, gaslight them to have certain attitudes, um, to shape their beliefs so that they would buy more products of a particular um, advertiser. And and for me, that has to play some role right. in all of this and recognition. Yeah, recognition that we as a society are getting, we're literally being brainwashed in this amazing experiment of social media in our desire to be connected to one another through a network. Right. Yeah. It's very interesting. I don't know if you can, you've, well, let me go back and just say that, that you've led them a very interesting life as a younger person. You were a professional ice skater. Um, you were also a professional jet ski competitor. So when you say, and, and then adding to your business career, deciding to go to law school, to say that you're a hard worker is definitely an understatement. I mean, you have just gone for it. And I'm really excited about some of the new stuff that you're working on. Talking about Facebook, you've got some interesting things. I don't know if you can talk about them yet, but you've got some interesting things that are coming across your desk. Yeah, so it is, you know, I I, I feel so fortunate because some really great things are coming to me. Um, at this point in time, of course, um, I do do some consulting in in practice of law. Um, but um, beyond that, um, one of the things that intrigues me is this evolution that has come about primarily because of COVID and how we actually um, are seeing like who's going to want to return to an office right. and and how do we remain connected in maybe allowing some innovation to come forth within our own lives um, and take that risk um, you know yeah. do some really amazing things so long as we can be connected around the world um, I have gotten involved in Bitcoin, not because it's a store of value or potential investment, but because it can literally change the world through decentralized finance, where um, a young woman in Uganda or Rwanda can actually sell through e-commerce and um, value can be transferred. Those things can be paid for um, through Bitcoin for those that are unbanked. They don't even have a no, banking I, account. That's, yeah, I know that. Yeah. Everything is going to be different. Right. And and it's a social passion for me mm-hmm. to change the world for those that um, may be less fortunate right. um, or um, want to realize the dream. And here's where I think the real key is that we all have the ability to to create this amazing world if we can be given the tools and the ability to use those tools. Yeah. I thank you for saying that. And I think that this time at this time, 
I think we're going to see a lot of new innovations coming coming forth. We're going to see a lot of new new ideas, new platforms, new ways of of doing things that that we don't even know about yet. You know, new, right? That, that are just bubbling up as we speak. Yeah, absolutely, Cindy. I mean, it's um, if we can get the tools in the hands of these people. For instance, I live in the mountains and. Um, getting access to internet was nearly impossible until I got Starlink. And all of a sudden, I'm like sitting in downtown Seattle, being able to record this podcast because I have high speed internet now. Yeah. Um, and Starlink actually took its satellite internet to a village in Canada that had no connectivity, zero connectivity. And and they're now so so even going to school online was impossible, and now they're able to do that. Um, this village you can't even get to it um, in the winter time. Well, I mean, during most of the year, except by air. There, uh, can't, there's a lot of there are a lot of places in Canada that are like that. That are yeah, yeah, and this is a Native American village <laughs> that. Um, you know, access to technology was not available until Elon Musk brought Starlink, you know, and they're constantly launching new satellites. That will change the world. It will change the world, definitely. And you have also, uh, I'm so excited that you're going to be hosting for You Equals Me. You have a bunch of interesting guests I know that we already have lined up. We, we also have uh, a new platform that you're working on. Yeah, so I actually, as part of this, you know, having given a voice to integrity within the workplace, um, began to look at, you know, really what is driving um, much of the the things that we see in the news. And I realized that there's a need for for a podcast just on the voice, you know, our internal voice and that reveals itself externally. Um, and I was raised in a in a generation where, um, you know, if you tried to raise your voice or be angry in the house, it was don't talk back to me. Right. So you right. begin to, you know, silence that voice. Um, and so I felt as though I wanted to create a podcast where I could interview people who come from different points of view. Mm-hmm. Um, and and, you know, it really shook me when um, I got a text message from somebody who happens to believe differently than I do and said he was distraught. That was the word he used when um, the riots happened and Trump did not arrest pedophiles. And I'm like, where are you getting that? Like that for me is astounding because it's so diametrically opposed to my own beliefs and reality. But those voices need to be heard. Yes. And and I think it's really important that we don't discount or discourage them from speaking out, but allow them to speak out and then have a discussion as the premise of the voice to, to be able to have detailed discussions. Um, Anderson Cooper just had an interview with somebody who apologized for believing that Anderson Cooper ate babies. I mean... Uh. Yeah. You know, and it was it was it was the kind of thing that needs to happen where you confront those people and say, "Okay, well tell me why you think that." Right. 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 And also uh something else you mentioned Lynn that I thought was really intriguing was a discussion on your podcast on the voice uh, the GameStop phenomenon and ha- helping people understand, you know, exactly w- what happened and how that could happen. I thought that would, that was very interesting for a lot of people that aren't in the financial world. You know, we don't have any idea what that's. Yeah. So, so I, um, after I left Enron, I spent about 12 years overseeing the development of a mathematical model that would predict the next Enron inspired by game theory, mathematical game theory. Mm -hmm. Um, In order to predict who was going to be the next Enron, in order to rate these companies and advise, sort of like we have a credit score, advise investors when there may be a problem on the horizon. And I began to see through that process that Wall Street 
is as dysfunctional of an element of society as you can possibly imagine. Uh -huh. You know, we end up with short sellers and, and it is a vehicle by which investors, sophisticated investors can make money. And then there's something called naked short sellers who don't actually borrow the stock in order to short it. They actually, um, you know, begin to be part of the wheel of fortune for Wall Street or the casino. Uh -huh. And and what happened is you had an uprising. Um, now, of course, it's not sustainable. I mean, these these. I'll call them the little guys. I, that's just the people that don't have access to the sophisticated trading. Yes. And they begin through the network that they have to begin to fight off, um, sort of in a David and Goliath moment, fight off these short sellers and worse, naked short sellers. So for instance, GameStop, I think it has 71 million shares. That's all the company has ever issued. And there's like 120 million shares that were being traded. And it's there's no way that that shows the illegal nature of it. Yeah. And there was this uprising. And, and they're as committed as you can possibly imagine. Of course, the stock has dropped by 50%. So, you know, people weren't necessarily buying in at 400, but there was such a demand that you know, the stock went from 1780 to 483 dollars in a matter of about two weeks. Yeah, and and the sad thing is, what they're saying is, this is an injustice. They were trying to, these short sellers try to drive these companies out of business, and I know this for a fact because Enron was hit by a short seller who I have now engaged with, named Jim Chanos, and and Jim saw fraudulent things, thought their stock was overpriced, so he shorted it. Yeah. Um, sometimes that works for him and sometimes it doesn't. And um, that's all legitimate and it plays a role actually to, to keep companies honest. Right. But when you target companies that are honest in a means by which you can put them out of business and then you never have to repay the shares, you just take the windfall. I see a problem with yeah, it. I it, think it's yeah, it's criminal, unconscionable. It, it, really it is, is criminal. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, well, I can't believe we're already at 30 minutes and I'm not even finished with my questions. <laughs> I, I also then want to go into, um, I know you're extremely knowledgeable in the spiritual world, which is my bailiwick. I just love it. And I know, um, that you also recognize the U equals me foundation. It's, it's more than just objecting to intolerance or ethics. It's, it's an understand the U equals me is an understanding of the human experiences, understanding that we're, we all have our differences and imperfections and the knowing that we belong here. Can you talk a little bit about your spiritual knowledge or your spiritual life? Sure. Um, when I was in my mid to early 20s, I, I actually came to understand about the power of meditation. And, you know, I do happen to believe I, I'm not necessarily a religious person. And in fact, um, you know, focus on really that connection with something that created this universe. I, you know, I don't know exactly what it is. Um, I happen to call it God. Um, other people call it other things and refer to the universe often, and came across a book, um, well, two books that sort of changed my life. One was A Course in Miracles, mm. and I came to hear uh, of a number of lectures that really resonated with me. And then the, the other one was Conversations with God, um, which was just profound, at least the first book for me. Um, and I began to see that this connection, it runs through everything, right? So I don't have to tell the trees in the forest behind me to grow. They just grow. Right. And um, I'm sure that there's something more to this from a physics perspective. But then I began to look at quantum physics and really went on a journey. I, and I, came, I love it. I circled back around. And as I've told you, I believe that life is very simple. We are an expression and expansion of the universe or God. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's it, no more, no less, right? right. And that, that is sort of the alpha and the omega. 
that it is all encompassing. Mm -hmm. That if, if at every moment we say, I know that I am an expression and expansion of this universal force. Um, and so just let me open my mind and my heart to what that force desires I do in life right. and then get out of the way, yes. right? Stop judging, stop criticizing, stop saying, well, why hasn't this happened for me? Or why hasn't that happened for me? Mm -hmm. um, but rather look with gratitude as to, I mean, this is an amazing experience. Yeah, it really is to recognize uh, your own personal power, our own personal power by just allowing. It, it's so profound. I just love it. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's sort of as I describe it, it's like getting up at Christmas every day. <laughs> like you oh, you don't know what today's package is going to unfold. Right. But as you as you open up to the possibility, um, it is unbelievable. Yeah of what we can do. I just read that the first human is going to go into space um, on SpaceX, and he's actually um, having a lottery to raise money. He's a very wealthy man, is having a lottery to um, allow someone to be lucky enough um, to, to be on that, on that flight with him wow. he'll go into suborbital destination for about two days and he's doing it to raise money for saint jude's medical center oh, which provides health care for children free of charge yeah. yeah and so and so you go wow i mean think of the possibilities of you know had Elon Musk not said okay i may be a little bit crazy but i'm gonna go forward and i'm gonna create this um you know, flight system, yep. you know, it's just really amazing if we allow ourselves to open up to possibilities. Yeah. yeah. He's amazing. I think it's uh, Elon Musk. We're talking about his sister. I think I once read, she said that her brother has the ability to see into the future. That's how connected he is to, you know, his in internal rather than his external. Yeah. And, and think about that in the context of you equals me, right? So if Elon Musk can do this, right. so can all of us. Exactly. It's just that Elon Musk has removed the filter that says, I can't do that. He right. says, well, no one's told me I can't, or, you know, let me show you. Right. The greatest opportunities in my life have been when someone said, well, you can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be like, you're like, what? It's that, <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. That's the competitive side of me that says, oh, watch me. I love it. Oh, it's so fun to have you on. I'm so glad to talk to you today. We are looking forward to you hosting the You Equals Me podcast. I will, uh, Lynn, I'll leave your contact information in the show notes and um, you can also follow Lynn Brewer on Twitter and LinkedIn. It's really fun. Mrs. Mean Tweets. You'll get a little taste of that. It's super fun. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks for coming today. Thanks so much, Cindy, for having me. I appreciate it. My pleasure. And thank you for listening. Please help us grow and share this podcast. You can purchase You Equals Me logo wear tax deductible at youequalsme.org or you equals me Etsy store, all one word in your Google search. And for a complimentary copy of our ebook, Wisdom Along the Way, a book of notes and quotes, you can join our One Worlders email list at youequalsme.org. Thank you so much. Much love around the world. Be kind, be brave, be you.